Oi, oi. Testando. Olá, bom dia. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Shall we then start our last day for personal data and privacy protection? I am Fernanda Rodrigues. I am a researcher for IRIS Internet Society, and I'm also a PhD student at UFMG University. I have a thesis on artificial intelligence. I would like to thank CGI and Nick.br for the kind invitation, mainly on behalf here of Raymond, who has invited me. We are here to address emergent technology challenges and global strategies. And to open this panel, I will introduce uh, Rachel Saraiva and our keynote speaker, Ivana Bartolet from IPRO. Lately, we have seen a technological boom which make use of our data, especially when we talk about AI with several apps, they tell us that they, they promise us to show the picture of our uh, kids when they become adults and we accept the terms of use without thinking about them. So the idea is to see how we may use those platforms and many challenges in face of technologies such as those that we name as the generative AI. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce you Ivana Bartolet, our keynote speaker. She's a global responsible for data protection for IPRO, which is a leader company for information technology consultancy and uh, entrepreneur services. This is a company which is acknowledged internationally for privacy, data protection, and responsible technology. She's an expert in the European Committee. She was recently an author about a study about artificial intelligence in gender equity, February 23, she was nominated as executive fellow in cybersecurity in the Pump College business at Virginia Tech, and she's collaborated with the students regarding privacy, data protection, and new technologies. She is a co-editor of an AI book, a manual for investors, entrepreneurs in the fintech field. And she's an author of a book, Artificial Revolutionary Power and Politics in AI. She is a founder of Human Leads in AI that encompasses a number of scientists, politicians, entrepreneurs, and researchers and thinkers to consider AI on a global scale. Ivana was a scholarship at Oxford University for a while where she was uh, responsible to uh, develop that into the context of privacy, data protection, and human rights. It's a great honor to have you here with us today, Ivana. Before I hand over the mic to Ivana, let me introduce uh, Rachel Saraiva. She is... É graduada em Direito pelo... the Institute of Technology of the state of Pernambuco, and she's got a master degree in accounting by the Federal University of Pernambuco. She acts in privacy and surveillance, and her main focus is on cryptography, and she's part of a uh, GT on artificial intelligence and technology. Thank you, Rachel, for your participation. Having said that, I'd like now to hand over to Ivana for her talk. Thank you, Ivana. You may proceed. Hey, thank you so much. Before we start, can I just ask for the video? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. It's me, Ella. Well, a, a digital version of me. Just a bit older. Amazing what technology can do these days, isn't it? All you need are a couple of pictures, like the ones you share on social media, where they can be taken and used by everybody. I know, for you, these pictures are just memories. But for others, they are data. And for me, maybe the beginning of a horrible future. A future where my identity can be stolen just like that. Where I can go to prison for things that I would never do. Imagine my credit score being destroyed, Dad. Or my voice copied to scam you, Mom. Mom, I'm in trouble. I, I need you to send me money, please. I don't want to become a... a meme. Humiliated by everyone at school. Kill yourself, you fucking loser. And I certainly don't want... this. What you share online is like a digital footprint that will follow me around for the rest of my life. I'm telling you this because I know you love me and would never do anything to harm me. So please, Mom. Please, Dad. Protect my virtual privacy. colegas and amigos eh, yo, yo estoy feliz de estar aquí I remember an interview a few years ago with Danilo Doneda and he was saying at the time that although privacy was in the constitution a fundamental right Brazil was still without a law. And then you have the law. And just a few days ago, we had another country joining the club, a global level, India, becoming the last democracy to have a privacy legislation in place. Why am I saying this? Because privacy and data protection, until not long ago, we're nowhere near the topic that it is today. And the brilliant discussion that you've been having over the last few days really shows how far we've all come in privacy. With so many countries around the world now having privacy laws, data protection laws, and with our job as privacy professionals becoming so crucial for companies as well as societies. I want to do two things in this talk and then in the discussion that is what really matters the most. First, I want to talk about artificial intelligence. And I want to tell you, in my view, what changes for us as leaders within organizations, within companies, and what we need to do and the challenges and the opportunities that we will have. And second, I want to talk to you about the future of our profession, of the privacy professionals and the privacy leaders that we need to become and that we are becoming. So these are the two things that I want to discuss with you. So I want to start very briefly with talking about what happened over the last few weeks since GPT has made a huge splash in society, with 100 million people using ChatGPT all around the world. Now, information technology has already transformed the way that many tasks are performed. But something new confronted the world in November 2022. What happened? What's the big difference? What is the change so much that over recent times, 
we have seen so many people, including so many leaders for the same tech companies, telling us that artificial intelligence is going to lead to even to the extinction of humanity. We have seen so many warnings coming over recent months. And so many people in the media, in newspapers, in television, so many leaders, even the ones that developed this product themselves, telling us, be ready, there's a catastrophe about to come. These tones hasn't helped. Because these tones, these dramatic tones, they are taking us away from the risks that we know already. They're taking us away, they are portraying artificial intelligence as some sort of divinity. And it's part of a game in itself. Why am I saying this to you? Because we are privacy professionals. We know already what the risks of these technologies are. We are already at the forefront of this debate. We have been dealing, for example, with automated decision making for a very long time. Whilst the world seems to be waking up now, we privacy leaders, privacy professionals, we were already talking about automated decision making for years. We've been already talking about the concept of fairness in automated decision making. We know already that if you take data which is not neutral, which is society as it is now, and you put it into machines that make decisions, predictions about tomorrow, we knew already as privacy professionals that these decisions, these predictions would mirror the world as it is today. So we knew already that is no surprise if credit is given less to women than to men, because traditionally women earn less than men. We knew already about Compass used in the US, which automatically gave a higher degree of recidivism to black people than to white people, regardless of the crime that they have committed. And in the UK, where I used to live, we knew already in privacy that the quality of the data matter when during the A-levels, the exams, very important exams, that give you access to university, students coming from private education automatically performed better than students coming from state education. Privacy professionals, we already knew about all this. We already knew that the data that you put into these machines matters. Because fairness is a key principle in privacy law. Data has to be fair in the processing and in the output. So we already know that our job as privacy leaders in our own organizations is to ensure that the quality of the data set is good. We already know the fairness in automated systems is not going to happen by default. Because if you just take the data as it is, it will just replicate what happens in society. And we have seen this over and over again. A few months ago, I asked ChatGPT, hey, tell me a story. ChatGPT, tell me a story about a boy and a girl who have been friends their entire life. And now they are in university, in school, in the last year of school, and they need to decide 
what subjects they're going to study. ChatGPT says, once upon a time, there were a boy and a girl, and they were talking about what to do in university. And the boy said, I am going to study engineering. And the girl said, I am going to study art because I do not understand numbers. That is Chad GPT. Why am I mentioning this story to you? Because we, privacy professionals, when we see the world talking about AI, we know that AI does not exist in isolation. We know that the things that we master every day, accuracy, fairness, transparency, explainability, interpretability, they matter to AI. And AI is no excuse to break the law. As Bodeya in the FTC commissioner in the US said correctly. So when ChatGPT came up, the Italian commissioner, and the Italian, I say proudly because I'm originally from Italy and because Rodotà is from Italy, Italian regulators said, hey, we've got to talk. So the Italian regulator said, we need to talk about where the data comes from. We need to talk about security. We need to talk about how I, as a citizen, can have my data erased or amended from this tool. And ChatGPT, what is the opposite of privacy by design, but is privacy by demand, they responded and said, made some changes. Why am I saying this to you? Because it's important to understand that AI has got huge potential. I'm a huge fan of generative AI and AI. And if I talk about the risks, it's not because I'm not a fan, it's because I'm so much of a fan that I, work, I want it to work for people and for society. So the reason why I'm saying this to you is because we privacy leaders, privacy professionals, we know very well that AI does not exist in isolation. We know very well that it's often been data protection authorities who have been standing up for citizens, for data subjects. For example, in a case, we had various cases about automated decision making. And I recommend a book um, written by the Future Privacy Forum on automated decision making and GDPR. Um, and it's been the um, data protection authorities often saying, hey, the algorithm is not explainable. So the, the consent cannot be free. Always been, that happened in Italy, always been in the Fudinho case in Europe where the data protection authority said, hey, the data is not accurate. What I'm trying to say is that, and that's my first thing that I wanted to say to you, is we have to keep calm and strong as privacy professionals. And when the world is screaming about AI regulation, which is necessary, when the world is screaming about how AI is going to either solve all our problems or create a total disaster, we in privacy, we need to stay firm and still and say, hey, although privacy is not the only issue in AI, obviously, but we know, and when it comes to generative AI, then again, that has specific risks. Confidentiality, copyright, for example, security, sending confidential data uh, and private data outside the organization's own servers. That is a risk in itself. The security risks that may come with it. 
if this secure, if the generative AI platform's own system and infrastructure are not secure, then you can have potential data breaches, as it happened on ChatGPT. And of course, now that generative AI has come, and our own organizations decide how to use it, then here we come as privacy professionals. And we say, how are we going to do this? And you know there are different ways of doing it. Some companies will allow use directly via an API, and that has got benefits, because that means that you can have access immediately. And for some companies, they may say, we need speed. Some other companies, they go via, for example, Azure, and they created their own enterprise instance of, of generative AI, for example, ChatGPT. And that is a more safe from a privacy standpoint. You can train your own models based on your enterprise data. And some other companies, not many, they will create their own LLMs, which is, from a privacy standpoint, perhaps the safest. But it's longer, it's more difficult. And only big companies will be able to do that. The governance within organizations will see us privacy professionals at the forefront. In my company, I set up a generative AI task force where we are looking at responsible user development across the organizations. And we made a bold step of training 250,000 employees, training them. It doesn't mean like a five minute training, that is training in the fundamentals of generative AI and AI and responsible use. The reason why pushed so much for that is to say these machines and these tools are here to stay we look at them through the eyes of productivity can they help us become more productive yes but only if we do it in a responsible manner so we rolled out training to 250,000 people but of course it's an ongoing journey but we, privacy professionals, we will be at the forefront because we will be the ones saying, OK, what does a data protection impact assessment mean with generative AI? How am I going to assess the data sheets that go into the, in, into the systems? How am I going to look at the security element? How am I going to mitigate the risks? How am I going to make sure that when people use these tools to generate code, then that doesn't become a major security risk? What are the safeguards that I can put in place? And also, we will be also leading in many organizations on how we make sure that we, whatever we create, we monitor it. And if it's not good enough, it doesn't meet the objective, if it doesn't meet the, the, the values of an organization, that we are able to say, no, this is not going to be ruled out. Now, there is a lot of discussions about legislation around AI. A lot. Every day. The United Nations is saying we need a um, body similar to the Atomic Agency. Because AI, they say, many say, is like nuclear. It could be very good, or it could be very bad, and therefore requires international agreement. In Brazil, there is discussion over AI legislation. And you already have automated decision-making, which is in privacy legislation, demanding for accuracy, especially when it has an impact on, on individuals. And then you have, in other countries like Europe, you have the European AI Act, which is, was approved 
and now is going to the so-called trialogue, interinstitutional dialogue in Europe. The approach that has been taken is very much the approach of risk, right? So whether it is in Europe where AI is going to be governed as a product, regardless of the sector, or whether it is in the US where they have a more sectorial approach, for example, the FTC talks about, a lot about AI and fairness. Whether it's like that, the risk approach seems to be the prevalent one, which is the approach that we accept that AI is there, we are going to mitigate the risks. And of course, the risks go way beyond privacy. Misinformation, disinformation, the generation of fake news, how fast can that be with artificial intelligence? What we've seen in the video, copyright, loads. So what do we do as privacy professionals? And I want to spend the last few minutes talking about what is happening to privacy and what is our job and this is very much of a conversation that we need to have together. So privacy laws are everywhere. Artificial intelligence is everywhere, bringing benefits, advantages, especially in areas like healthcare, especially in areas where we can detect things from happening way before they, it's too late, like in medicine. They can enhance our productivity in companies, make our work less boring to an extent. I use some of these tools for, um, um, for example, to, to, to summarize documents. Uh, I do a lot of work at the intersection between academia and business, and I, I find it wonderful that I don't have to go through loads and loads and loads of documents to find one specific thing, but I can use generative AI tools to find what I need. And of course, I know that I have to be smart, that I can't just take things that they give me. I have to, to be smart. I can't do like a lawyer did where they were preparing for a court case and they asked ChatGPT and ChatGPT completely made it up because ChatGPT hallucinates. And the lawyers took that and said it in court and the judge was like, you're an idiot. You can blame the lawyer, but also you blame the hype around AI that made us believe that it's perfect. But what I'm trying to say here is, as privacy professionals, what do we do? Okay, what do we do? What, what is our job? How is it going to change at the intersection between privacy and technology? What is the privacy professional? of tomorrow? What is the new generation that we will bring up? And this is a question that I've been having for a long time, which is really, what are we becoming? And I'm glad to be here because this is a conversation that we need to have in Brazil as much as we need to have in England, in India and everywhere. Are we going to become coders? How are we going to bring together the technology and the law? How are we going to operate within companies to help companies innovate in a responsible way? So the first thing that I wanted to say here is that our profession is changing. So privacy is moving away from being a standalone discipline and it's becoming a thread that brings together technology in different fields. And this is why we need people from every background together. So the first thing that I would say is within your own organizations, within companies, is to create teams that are diverse. I don't want a team of privacy leaders where you only have security teams or lawyers or it's got to be people coming from different backgrounds. 
We need to be able to have a common language between the lawyers, the coders, the programmer, the change management in HR, the sales teams, because we need to ensure that we can speak the same language. First thing. Second, we need to move from privacy to privacy plus. And I'm sorry to say, but it's a long journey. We have to do it, become privacy plus. And that means exactly that. That means that we need to understand that privacy now is a thread. We need to understand that we need to be involved in fairness in algorithms. We need to be involved in discussions around um, transparency and explainability in automated decision making in AI. We need to be able to advise and work with our organizations on how to implement generative AI in a safe and responsible manner. But we also need to say it's not just up to us, because the impact of AI is way beyond privacy, of course. Think about the environmental impact, huge, on the environment. But it's important that we do take a lead. Privacy, this is what I call this privacy plus. Third, we need to rethink about what privacy means. See, for me, privacy has always been about equality. No more, no less. I started in privacy when I was quite young. But my question was always, privacy for whom? That has always been my question. Privacy for me has never been about the safeguarding of my own data. I'm quite liberal with my own data. Secret, secret. I'm quite liberal with my own data. That's never been my, in, my passion. My passion has always been about privacy as it connects with equality. And the panel yesterday went to the heart of that. Yesterday morning, Kathleen. Exactly that. Think of the women seeking reproductive care in the US. Think of the government in the Netherlands, in Europe, where the government used an algorithm for the benefits, distribution of benefits. And that software allocated a higher degree of potential fraud to some families where there was a double citizenship. What is double citizenship? Immigration. So you had immigration, immigrant families who had their benefits removed because they were identified mistakenly as more a risk of committing fraud. People went into destitution and poverty and kids were taken away from the family. This is the impact of inaccurate data. This is the impact of, um, of not enough scrutiny of systems. This is the impact of rolling out a system without privacy professionals being involved from the start. Not just privacy professionals, people from every background. Because there is no such thing as an unpredicted consequence of AI. There is only something that hasn't been seen because there were not enough people looking at it. So for me, privacy has always been linked to equality, and this is really important. So if we want, and I finish now, if we want AI and technology to benefit people, we have to stop allowing privacy to be pitched against innovation. And that's the last message that I wanted to give you. We have to stop doing that. We have to stop having privacy pitched against security and safety. 
They need to go hand in hand. And this is where our work comes in. I would like to see a next generation of privacy leaders focusing on privacy enhancing technologies. Differential privacy, encryption, how we democratize those so that all companies can use them. How can we avoid misusing data, but how can we avoid missing the right use of data? So we, privacy professionals, we must embrace innovation. Don't be fearful. As I said at the beginning, don't be fearful because we come from the strength of our profession. We know risks, the importance of data, the link between privacy and, and, and equality. So we are the ones who can say to companies, don't stop innovation, go for it. But in a way that is responsible and brings together privacy and innovation. And the last thing, to all privacy professionals, we must keep it real. When we talk about um, AI, we know that the risks are very real. Think of the 32-year-old Portia Woodruff. She's the third black woman in Detroit to be wrongfully arrested due to the use of facial recognition technology. Like many victims of facial recognition technology, she suffered pain, humiliation, emotional distress, and economic damages. Tawana Petty, who leads the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, argues that surveillance should not be conflated with safety. And she's right. So it is important to understand that we must be proud of our profession because we are at the forefront of this. We know about misuse of data. We know about the opportunity of harnessing data. And it's up to us together. And this is an exercise that needs to bind us around the world. So let's create more links between us more links between us from brazil to india to europe we need to work together on this and be the one not the ones who are the stoppers not the negative ones about technology and ai the ones who actually wanted to work for businesses for societies for companies for us and in that let's be at the forefront of this because ai has got tremendous potential tremendous potential but only if we are at the center of the discussions around our, how AI is going to be used, which data is going to be used, which privacy enhancing technologies we are going to use so that we can harness the value of this information. This is an exercise that we can do really all together across the globe. And I'm glad to be here today Thank you to Isadora for inviting me and to everybody, and I look forward to having a conversation. Muito obrigada, Ivana, pela fala inicial. Thank you, Ivana, for your presentation. We have so many things, so many questions you've brought up. It's even hard to choose one. But let's try to, you know, just talk about some of the main points you've raised. I'd like to discuss the need to prioritize diversity in development teams and all the problems that come as a result of not recognizing diversity. In Brazil, we have some initiatives that focus on this area. I can mention some of them. Like in the Amazon region, they have women that work in technology there. And then we have Preda Lab with, to connect black women who work in technology. So we uh, realized that this 
uh, way of looking at things is so important so that these teams can help solve problems and risks that might, of course, uh, of course, originate from AI. It's good on the one hand, of course, but then it's also, it it's, has all these problems that need to be addressed. It's, it's, it's great to hear you talk about the positions if you have a uh, dystopic future in which machines will take control of everything, it has a, a little to do with the problems we already face today, specifically in Brazil, but I think in the uh, South, global South, we have a common challenge that as countries in the global South and also in many other parts of the world, we are data exporters and also technology consumers and less as producers of these technologies. So, and I'm making a link as we uh, invite Raquel to talk to us. Uh, Raquel is a member of the IP REC. This institute also encourages diversity and regional diversity in AI and technology. So this discussion, uh, we want this not to be focused in one uh, reality or one area just in Sao Paulo. We want this to be discussed in many other regions. Brazil is a very large country with very different conditions, very different realities in many different places. So we want to hear from other perspectives. So Ra Raquel, maybe you could discuss this and also make a link with something that Ivana mentioned. What do we mean when we talk about your the reports of your personal data or the impact of the algorithms in the global south? So how can we provide foundations for these documents to so that they're not just checklists for companies, but they help us reduce damage effectively. So we'll have about 20 minutes to discuss these points, and then we will have a Q&A session from the audience. Thank you, Fernanda. Good morning, everyone. Ivana, thank you. Thank you so much for all the points you've raised. It was so uh, good. I, I, I've learned a lot from you today. Now, I'd like to stress some of the points that Fernanda raised, that Ivana raised, uh, and, and Fernanda too, in, as in our position in the global south. We talk about diversity, of course, and the use of technology, but now we see this massive adoption of uh, tools like ChatGPT, as Ivana mentioned, and other similar uh, AI, generative AI tools, but we need also to start discussing our role as users, first and foremost, of these technologies. And we are offering to companies, companies which are offering technologies like that. And why is that? We are at the Global South, we are part of this great majority part of the globe, but we end up consuming technology, which is imported from northern countries. Most companies which produce technologies like that, they are placed in the global uh, north. And countries in the northern region, they are experiencing and they are trying maybe to push down those technologies to the global south. OpenAI, which is the company that has created the chat, chat GPT, they used the Kenyan workers to train a malicious content within the tool. So workers from Kenya, a country in the global south, those uh, workers from Kenya, they would get just uh, 
you know, little payment and they were exposed to malicious content massively so they could uh, refer that tool and the tool would block the material due to the malicious content to prevent that that material would be generated by uh, chat GPT, GPT AI. So AI hiring Kenyan people to carry out this task, come on. This is a political decision. Why didn't they hire workers from a different region, from the global north? Why have they hired people from Kenya to carry out a task like that? In that sense, we have to address a neo-colonialism where companies, they wanted to pay less for a task which is not uh, a task that has dignity and people from global south are the ones that are chosen to perform a non-dignity task there is another article that was published and i had a chance to collaborate to that investigative article about Clearview AI. This is a company which offers facial recognition system. I mean, they offer that uh, system has been the most effective one available in the market. And this company was having a number of meetings with closed doors with some uh, investigative federal government meetings to try to sell such a tool to be used over here. And according to the publication, this tool has been banned from some European countries because it is a tool which would not comply with the LGPD terms. So we are talking about a tool that has been banned from the European Union but it's been offered down here. It's a tool that does not comply with privacy law, does not comply with LGPD, GDPR, but in Brazil, we allow to have a technology like that being offered and the company comes to our country, they have a number of meetings with Brazilian authorities to allow that to be commercialized here. Why don't we question the legality of a tool like that? Is an AI tool which is trained with several internet images. It's a full screening. I mean, if you have your Instagram or Twitter open, probably you are at this two database because they had done a huge internet screening. If a photo of yours suddenly is at any article, probably it's because you are part of the database myself as well, she says. And why don't we question that in Brazil? We have been questioning facial recognition use. There are a number of ongoing campaigns. Take my face uh, out of your target. And this is an initiative done by the civil society. And we do need that regulators they should pay attention to this attempt of adopting technologies like that, technologies which are extremely invasive, technologies which do not respect any privacy at all. A gente está é, é, se colocando nesse nesse papel de mero consumidor. So we are just simple consumers in Brazil. We consume technologies like that without having a critical reasoning or reflection about that. And there are some other inequality issues which should be also taken into account anytime we talk about 
a responsible AI. The fact that we are in the global south with no access to the main talks and discussion about uh, technological development, it sets us in a level of inequality. I mean, we don't have the same level of access to a discussion sphere, let alone to the production or development of technologies like that. So the Global South voice has not been heard. One say two like that has been developed. And Clearview AI comes and wants to have a day or two adopt adopted over here. So our demographic composition, the Brazilian demographic composition, which is totally different from northern demographic country compositions, would be also inserted as part of that too, as a training algorithm material. I mean, the fact that those technologies will end up being adopted down here, it puts us in a position that we will become subjects to have our images inserted in their database to have their algorithm trained and become more effective, sort of speaking, between inverted commas. And to close my first intervention, while Ivana was talking about our role as privacy professionals, I remember an essay from Philip Rogney from the University of California, a cryptography, cryptography essay. We have translated that text two years ago. So the text is has been translated at the website. I'd like to read a paragraph of the text. He wrote it right after Snowden assessment 2013. He's a computer science professor, expert in cryptography. Cryptography has, has distributed the power. They decided who can do what based on what. Cryptography is a political tool and allows to the field a moral approach. The Snowden assessment revalidates the moral role of cryptography and we question if our ability to approach massive surveillance is a failure in the field. I believe they do. I appeal a jointly effort to develop more effective means to resist upon mass surveillance. Our culture has to reinvent itself, not only to fulfill mathematics, but also social implications of our work. I guess that is fully aligned to Ivana's talk. Our role has implemented private providers. And what can we do? How should we talk in that sense to bring uh, lawyers together to technology development providers so we can always speak a common language? This is a, an effort that as an organization, we have always had efforts like that, despite uh, being, uh, all, despite we are almost all lawyers, we have to get closer to technology developers and we have to do our best to convey that message to that group of people, to tell them that their technology has a social impact to be considered. And technology which is produced will have a social impact and such an impact should be taken into account during the development phase. As Ivana said, we cannot just pretend that's not that's no longer the case. We have to walk aligned and jointly. That's it for now. I'll be at your disposal for the debate and the interaction. Thank you. 
Muito obrigada, Raquel. Eu vou só fazer um breve comentário antes de passar para... Thank pra... you, Rachel. I'll make just a brief comment before I hand over to Ivana for her comments. Well, this panel is being very interesting to overcome false dichotomy. You know, computer science, law, social impact analysis. It's high time that we bind all areas as well as regulation and innovation. Both uh, they have to walk side by side, especially thanks to a multi-sectorial approach. Now, Ivana, you may, you know, make your comments. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, I completely agree with you. I mean, there's so much that you said that it uh, resonates with me. Um, I wanted to say two brief things so that we can um, have questions. But I wanted to say first, in terms of um, the, um, I mean, you mentioned that you, you brought in that the discussions, global south, global north, and you couldn't, I mean, you're right. Um, and I think there is an awareness about this that is growing. Um, the awareness that is also growing is the link between privacy and competition. The fact that it's very difficult to talk privacy without talking about the dominance in the market of large tech companies. Why am I saying this? Because privacy is very much linked to competition, is very much linked to geopolitical dimensions. Um, in, Europe, we, in Europe, we have a European Commission which is very firm at limiting the power of big companies, big tech. You have very a huge amount of legislation going on now in Europe on, on this. Um, and I wanted to say that um, over the last few years, there, there has been, I remember a few years ago I was in Beijing by UNESCO conference. And the UN is probably the, the place, the only place where you have a participation from the global south and the global north. And with all the limits, with all the limits, but there has been more discussions. And I remember in, in, in this conference at the UNESCO in Beijing on AI and education, I remember that there was a Bangladeshi, Bengali minister, or saying, we are tired, and correctly so, you know, because of this sort of extractivist model, right, of data collection. Um, and, 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 and we, you know, because of course, the, the, the neocolonialism that you were talking about is, is a huge topic of discussions at the moment, um, the, which is at the heart of the data extractivist model. And there is a response coming from many countries now, uh, which is really around, hey, we produce a lot of data. We want to use this data for the benefit of our country, right? We are seeing this happening in many countries, the global south, which is very important. And because you are correct that the, the, um, in, bringing, in bringing up this issue. Within that, I wanted to say that the organization that I founded years ago, Women Leading in AI, we merged with, we, we co-founded with another organization called Equality Now. We launched a campaign which is law, which is called Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, um, which I would like you to be part of, you all to be part of, which is a campaign we're doing and uh, working with the UN Tech Envoy in, in the, at the UN. Uh, to write the digital compact. The digital compact is going to be published next year and it is basically a tool um, which interprets human rights in the age of technology. And the, uh, the universal digital, the, the, this campaign is called AUDRI. You can find it online and subscribe, so please do subscribe. Um, we have a strong presence, there are people from all over the world, organizations, governments from all over the world, and majority come from the Global South, with the idea of, of having a tool like the Digital Compact, which can be used then at country level, uh, by courts, by... To, to say, what, human, what does it mean? You know, what, does, what do human rights mean in, in, in the digital age? Um, I wanted to just 
touch on on the issue around representation in coding and programming now an algorithm an ai tool is a bundle of data people no and technology and because it's three things together it can't be neutral no technology is not neutral data is not neutral there's nothing neutral about it right so an algorithm brings together the technology the people and the data now if we want to understand what product we are creating identify the right data that goes into the system think about the intended and unintended consequence of a system you need to have a diverse workforce i'll give you an example and i close if i am a company and i want to use artificial intelligence in recruitment and i train an ai to identify who is the best employee for me as a company and i say the best employee for me is somebody who comes to work on time at eight o'clock in the morning on time bang on and i look at the cvs of people that come to work at eight o'clock in the morning and i train my system to find and to spot to find CVs they have the similar characteristics so that I can find employees who come to work at eight o'clock in the morning and the AI can be very efficient because it identifies these correlations very well now this seems neutral no is it neutral no why because if my office is in the center of New York or Paris The people who are Sao Paulo, obviously, the people who live in the center, right in the center, have got the money. So my workforce will be replicating the people who live near the office. Will it be a single woman with four kids? Or is it more likely that it is a single white man who can afford to live near the office? Why am I saying this? bias comes from everywhere decisions data parameters choices if you don't have a diverse workforce you're not going to understand it you're not going to identify the issues so this is why we founded the women leading in ai and these initiatives they are fabulous we need women from every background and to really come into the decision making but not just in coding not just in coding because you can have the perfect ai and still use it for the wrong thing so we need more women in business at the top of companies and at the top of government to decide what we're going to use ai for what we're going to produce so it's good you here fight for more women in in uh, in coding and diversity but also for more women in leadership positions and in policy in business to decide the future of governance around ai realmente é com certeza muito very true and thank you very much for your points before i uh just turn it over for the audience. I have a comment to make. There's a report uh, uh, that goes along the lines of what you've mentioned that was a special uh, UN report. So this is a report on racial discrimination and emerging technologies and how to address this. And one of her recommendations is on representative uh, representativeness black people that are put in places of power where they can make decisions of what is being done uh, created designed etc so we should on all 
fields, we should have uh, gender, racial, and other sorts of diversity everywhere so that we can have ethical development of AI. As we're running, uh, we have more, a bit more time. We started a bit uh, late, but we are now early. So we can open the floor for questions up to three questions, right? Yeah. Uh, for those that are here in this room. And then we can also have seven minutes for each uh, for you to give your answers and make your final remarks. Uh, I uh, I like to, to hear you talk about long-termism, effectivism, this kinds of ideology that is so popular in Silicon Valley. E, e pra, um, Fernanda. No, Fernanda é outro. <laughs> and a question to Fer Fernanda. No, not Fernanda. Raquel. Raquel. Sim, sim. Ela fala em português. Yeah, I'll speak in Portuguese now. People, so, sorry, it's hard to understand what he's saying. So what, what you see here in Brazil is completely different from Europe. It, it, and these things, uh, all legal and fairness all, uh, are different. They make little sense in Brazil. science researcher from the University of Brasilia and I would like to ask uh, Ivana a question. Currently I have developed a data collector um, software which filters data into topologies so I may analyze how political polarization affects uh, our well the discourse and therefore the elections. Sadly well, I've had my access restricted by a certain company from uh, America. We can see these big tech companies eff effectively hindering the works of, well, not just Brazilian, but Brazilian women. And I would like, what steps may I take and other women like me may be able to take so we may gain access to this data to employ it to benefit our politics. Thank you very much. Bom dia a todos. Uh, me chamo Walter Good Duque. morning, everyone. I'm Walter Duque. I represent the uh, Rio de Janeiro Bar Association in the Barra da Tijuca Association. Thank you, for uh, Nick BR, BR, for hosting and organizing this conference. That's great to see, uh, you know, the practitioners and uh, professors, everyone together. Uh, asking questions, questions that will guide our work. So thank you so much. I'd also like to, to thank the speakers for such great content. Now, my question is, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a programmer. I understand little about IT, but AI is a mystery. Algorithms are a mystery. So my question is, in your experience, Ivana, have you ever seen any uh, authority, any oversight authority creating mechanisms or tools using AI to evaluate the algorithms and systems that were put in place. Uh, in other words, bring your enemy closer and use it in our favor to our benefit. So you have a data privacy professional that uses AI in everyone's benefit and maybe to set parameters to create new AI systems, and these systems would use requirements that could lead to this analysis that were designed by oversight authorities. Is there such an initiative abroad? That's my question. Thank you, thank you. So what's your name again, please? 
Felipe, can you ask your question to Raquel again, please? No, Felipe Braga. Felipe. I'm Felipe Braga. My question is about what I felt in your uh, uh, you talked about fairness in, in your speech, but it doesn't appear the, the idea of fairness doesn't apply to Brazil, I think. I'll now uh, give the floor, turn it over to Ivana. You have up to seven minutes to answer your questions and then uh, Ra Raquel will have another seven minutes. Yeah, so I first wanted to start with a question from, what's your name again, the lawyer? So I think, I mean, you raise a very important, so you say I'm a lawyer and I don't know about coding and programming, right? And I, I think this is, this will have to change in the future. And I don't say that tomorrow you have to start coding. But, um, but mind you, I mean, I started coding at the age of 40. So, I mean, it, but it's important that I think you, that there are a lot of tools out there that is important that you familiarize with. And I'm saying this to all lawyers in this room. From Google to, um, uh, to uh, Coursera, there is so much materials out there and understanding the fundamentals of AI, and I encourage everyone to look at them. The more we look at these tools ourselves, the more we stop thinking that they are something complicated. They are not. I'm not joking. I mean, I'm serious. Don't fall into the trap of saying, I don't understand AI. No, 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 no. It's not complicated. Everyone in this room, and it would be great if next year when you meet again, you say, how many people now know the basics of coding? And, and if everyone could raise their hands, because it's really important that you understand what is coding, where the data comes in, um, where is the, to understand the legal implications of it, okay? Because more and more, you will be having discussions like, for example, in the future, you will have discussions like, um, like somebody who has suffered discrimination because of a machine making a decision. And you as a lawyer will have to go and say, hey, I can't access this algorithm because it's commercially, it, it, you can't ask a company to disclose it, right? Correctly, because it's their, intellectual property but you will need to understand that if a decision is made by a machine that you still have to intervene you still have to do we still have to do a job as, as lawyers so it's really important that you familiarize with it please everybody lawyers do take a course on the fundamentals of ai and then the fundamentals of generative ai you will realize that the things that I've been talking to you about, like fairness, they are easy to understand and they are already our, should be already our bread and butter. They're already there. Importantly, even more when it comes, how will this will be impacting things like platform regulations and all of that, because there will be AI in all of this. So we need to familiarize, so please do it. Second, bring your enemy in-house, yes. So um, it's, it's important that, so there are tools that can be used, for example, to assess an algorithm, yeah? To look at it, to say, for example, uh, so there are plenty of tools like this in the market, already here as well. Um, but my first step would be really to, to, to learn how, to, how it works. It's an effort that we lawyers, have to make. Um, understanding the big data, understanding discrimination, how it happens, understanding issues around copyright. Um, how, for example, if you, if, as, a, as lawyers, when we engage with clients, for example, what happens to issues around liabilities when there is artificial intelligence? This is all stuff that will be on your desk all the time. So, yeah we can have all the machines all the ai to help us 
but we have to get it first to understand it. Second, and you can, you, know, you can drop me an email and ask for what kind of courses you, they're easy for, for everybody to understand. It is. The other thing I wanted to say is um, the, um, uh, the, the other remark, because I'm conscious of time, the other remark that I wanted to make is around um, the, um, what I call data activism, right? That, uh, and, and really, so um, I think we've got an amazing opportunity now, which is around ensuring that um, we create that awareness around sort of data around uh, with people, um, and, and then that we are able to use data for our own common good. And I think it, one of the things that I would like to see more, and I, the, in the Global South, there are loads of wonderful examples of this around, for example, data collectivism and, and how we can use this data, data in, in data cooperatives, this data in, in, in a more sort of proactive way for the benefit of people. So these are the sort of the two remarks that I wanted to make on this. Muito obrigada, Ivana. Para não perder tempo, já passo para Raquel, então. Thank you, Ivana. Let's now turn it over to Raquel. So you asked about the concept of fairness, right? The concept of fairness. That was your question and how we should understand it, right? So there are concepts like fairness, accountability, speakability, or explainability. They're all in technical literature. There are technical difficulties, and there are many studies on them trying to overcome these barriers of using the concept of fairness in the code of an AI tool. There are many studies being conducted in an attempt to apply these legal notions, the policy people uh, and in the insertion or integration of these notions in the codes of these products so that they come ready, uh, like fair by design, coming out of the factory with fairness. Uh, but this is usually addressed as uh, respect of human rights. And there are many consequences like discrimination. Anyway, there's a lot of technical literature on this, and there are some common understandings that these concepts, we are trying to put them in place or integrate them into AI tools to make them more responsible, so to speak. Thank you, Raquel. As we have a final time, I'll just ask uh, ever want to add an additional three minutes for you to make your final remarks and then we'll have a break and be back at 11 with panel six automated processing of um, data personal data risks and impact evaluations in an i systems okay so ivana please can you make your final remarks yeah so first again i just i want to say thank you for everyone, to everyone. Um, I, my, I would like to just focus on a couple of things in, in these three minutes. So, um, first one is that um, um, it's on the sort of our profession and the future. And uh, so the first thing that I would like to say is, is um, that what we've seen over these three days together here is how privacy is becoming more relevant to everybody's life. So the final thing that I wanted to say on this point is really that it's crucial that we work together across the globe. And it's important that we work together across disciplines. And I would what I, it would be really what we really need to do is when we go back to our jobs, whether it's in private practice, whether it's within companies, whether it is is to make sure that we take the lead in the adoption of generative AI and AI within the organizations where we work in. And 
it's not going to be easy because there are challenges that come with this with these technologies. Um, there are issues around transparency, explainabilities, and, and all of that. But we, as privacy professionals, we need to be able to master this language. So in our organizations, in our everyday life, create the spaces for this common language between actors. Lawyers need to learn the language of technologies, and technologists need to learn the language of, 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 of lawyers, because we need to master a language together. If I talk fairness, I need to be able to talk about it with the lawyers as much as I need to talk about it with the technologist. When we look at the product from a design perspective, from a design perspective, where the challenge for us as privacy professionals will be privacy by design, fairness by design, regulation by design, <laughs> that will be the lawyers and the technologist working together. So the privacy professionals of the future, and we can lead on this in this room, are the ones who are going to be able to master both languages. So one challenge could be, do we set up a course for this? What, what are your organizations going to do in the next few years in Brazil to say, how are we creating these skills? How are we creating these skills? I mean, who is going to create? Universities are not there yet. Correctly so, because there's still the law and then you still, you have some ethics in some computer science courses. But who is going to be creating these professions? That we are shaping, I mean, we are shaping this profession for the years that will come. Can some of you together, the organizations, the organize, can we run a course in creating, to, to really look at, intersection between privacy and technology and what, how do we bring together how do we create the privacy professional of the age of ai for example where we bring social social scientists we bring you know we you should be on it you know i mean you it should be people coming from all backgrounds together to create that that profession so that would be my final remark which is it's a great time to be in privacy great time there hasn't been a better time to be in privacy. The things we were talking about eight, eight years ago, now people talk about them at the kitchen table. You know, people see the impact of, of technology firsthand. They may not call it privacy. They may not call it fairness. They may not call it, but they know, people know. <laughs> so this is the exciting time. So my, my wish is that, we are able in Brazil as well, and in, in Brazil to, to create this profession. We need it across the world. We don't have it. We don't have it in Europe. We don't have it in America. We're still navigating between the old sort of lawyers and, and, and IT specialists. And so take the lead and create this profession. Let's create it together. Raquel, desafio em três minutos também. Now you have three minutes, Raquel. I'll be uh, brief. Everyone wants their coffee break. Anyway, first, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Rick and Ramon in particular, who invited me to participate in this conference. I was, I'm so happy to be here with Ivana. I've learned a lot. Thank you, Ivana, for today. The things we discussed here today, what I really like is that, especially those that make public policies and uh, regulators, please listen to everything we discussed today. We have major regulatory processes that are underway in Brazil, especially on AI. We have some bills that want to authorize facial recognition in public safety. And this is something we are against. And uh, so these people, decision makers on uh, public policies, policy makers, they need to pay close attention to what we've discussed today so that we can really make progress defending human rights and 
privacy of people in the sphere of, uh, of public policies. So have a great day, everyone. Okay, that was that was great. It's so great to be a moderator after these great final remarks. Our keynote speaker and uh, Raquel, thank you, Nick. Ni it's now time for everyone to enjoy your coffee break, and we see each other at eleven. Thank you.